Okay, we're ready to start. Welcome everybody to our webinar series. Today's special guest is Dr. Mariam Rahman from the University of Florida. She's a neurosurgeon and an assistant professor in the Department of Neurosurgery. Mariam, you could start. Thanks, Al. Um, as Al said, uh, I'm one of the neurosurgeons at the University of Florida, and I belong to the uh, Preston A. Well Center for Brain Tumor Therapy. Uh, and we have a big group there that includes the neurosurgeons, the neuro-oncologists, translational researchers, uh, radiation oncologists, neuropathologists, and neurologists that all work together to take care of patients in a very multi and interdisciplinary fashion. And what I'd like to talk about today are only two of the uh, 12 uh, clinical trials that we currently have at the University of Florida offered for our patients. And um, uh, first, I just want to kind of give an in, uh, overview about immunotherapy and glioblastoma because that's mostly what we focus on in terms of both our clinical trials and the work that we're doing in the laboratory. Uh, so the important thing to understand about patients with glioblastoma is that they start off very immunosuppressed even at the time of their diagnosis. And um, they have profound immune dysfunction at the time that they're even diagnosed before they've received any treatment. And all of this is worsened by the standard treatment that they undergo, which is mostly temozolomide and radiation. And all of that treatment causes their lymphocyte counts in their peripheral blood to go down significantly, uh, which also worsens their immunosuppression. And if you um, take lymphocytes and just simply infuse them into patients after they complete their radiation, it actually does not correct their lymphopenia and it does not reverse their immune dysfunction. So it's a multifactorial immune dysfunction that's not just due to the number of cells that are circulating in the blood. So this makes um, immunotherapy a little bit challenging in patients with, um, with glioblastoma because they're starting off in a very immunosuppressed state. But the strategies that we currently have to harness the host's immune system include vaccines, and that vaccines can kind of take two major forms. One are peptides. Peptides are essentially proteins that you can deliver. You inject, typically vaccines are not given IV, but actually given as an intradermal injection. And um, you can either get those proteins. Those proteins are then taken up by the host's own dendritic cells, which are cells that kind of um, surveil the body for things that are abnormal and then they take that abnormal thing into the lymph node and present that antigen to the lymphocytes in the lymph node, which will then circulate around trying to kill anything they see with that antigen. Um, or you can actually give a vaccine of the patient's own dendritic cells back to them. Uh, and these are the antigen presenting cells of the body, which means they take antigen that they, they kind of eat things that they find that may be abnormal and they present them to lymphocytes which then go around. And those are the killer immune cells in the body that go around and kill either abnormal cells or abnormal pathogens like in, um, infectious agents. The other thing you can do instead of doing a vaccine is actually infuse T cells, which are the lymphocytes, into the blood. And you can harvest those T cells from the host. Um, that process is called a leukophoresis, where you it's basically like a very large blood donation. You're, you're hooked up to a machine. It filters out your blood for the white blood cells and collects the white blood cells. And then we can take those into the laboratory and culture them in a way where they turn in mostly into T cells. And then... Um, show those T cells a particular antigen and infuse those T cells back into the host so they can circulate around and kill either the abnormal cells or um, abnormal pathogen. And you can also alter these T cells. So you'll, you may be hearing the word CAR T cells. Those are chimeric antigen receptor T cells, which have essentially been genetically modified so that they see a particular antigen or that they can kill a particular cell um, showing an antigen. And then finally, the last thing are a set of drugs called immune checkpoint blockade or immune checkpoint inhibitors. And these are essentially um, drugs that turn off T cells that usually reduce T cell function. And immune checkpoint inhibitors were naturally produced by the body so that T cells don't uh, function too much. Uh, so they don't just start killing random cells within your body because that would cause autoimmune disease. Um, and uh, cancer cells take advantage of this by upregulating these signals in T cells. So they shut T cells off so T cells cannot identify them or kill them. And essentially what these drugs are doing is reversing that process that the cancer cells are leveraging. And so these are kind of the three main categories of immunotherapy that currently exist, which are vaccines, T cells, and then immune checkpoint inhibitors. So we're working with all of these platforms in our laboratory and in our clinical trials. Dendritic cell vaccines is something we're particularly excited about. And the way this works is um, in uh, our current 
uh, phase two trial that we're um, offering is that we, uh, the patient newly diagnosed glioblastoma undergo surgical resection. They will then undergo leukophoresis where we collect the PBMCs, which are peripheral blood mononuclear cells. Uh, we then are able in our laboratory to isolate these cells and grow them in petri dishes into dendritic cells and allow them to mature. And then we actually electroporate them where we kind of infuse them with a particular antigen. And then when they mature, we, get, we collect them into a vial and in a syringe and then deliver them as a vaccine into the skin of both thighs. And then those um, cells migrate from the, the site of injection into the groin lymph nodes where they induce an immune response. The reason we're excited about this is that our phase one trial was um, published in Nature in 2015, uh, where patients with newly diagnosed GBM, where um, they all received the dendritic cell vaccine, but half of them also received a tetanus toxoid vaccine to induce a memory immune response. And in these uh, patients, they had a significant amount, more amount of dendritic cells actually make it to the lymph node. So this was, uh, oh no. Can you guys still see me? Yes, everything's good. Okay, I'm sorry. I feel like my, no, I just got an error. Oh, we just lost your screen. Okay, let me see if I can share screen again. And get my PowerPoint going again here. Okay, sorry that that happened. I apologize for my... No problem. Okay, so can you guys see that, Al? Yes, it just came back on. Great. Okay, so in this graph over here, this on the y-axis is showing you the percent dendritic cell migration. Wait a second, wait. We have your screen, but it's, there it is. Okay, got it. You got it? Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, so this here is your percent dendritic cell migration. And on the x-axis, these are... Uh, um, if you just receive saline intradermally, this is if you receive dendritic cells. Uh, this is if you received another immune agent called TNF-alpha. And then this is if they received the dendritic cell with a tetanus toxoid, and you can see that you have significant number of dendritic cells actually migrate to the lymph node. So the measurement here was how many dendritic cells are making to the lymph node. It was much higher here. And over here on this side, you can see the survival from the, in the, of the patients from the time of randomization uh, so the patients who received the dendritic cell vaccine that had a CMV uh, RNA uh, in it uh, against GBM, they lived significantly longer than patients who received um, dendritic cells uh, without the tetanus toxoid, which basically showed that the more dendritic cells you get to migrate from the site of injection to the lymph node results in a much more robust immune response and has the potential to significantly improve survival in patients with glioblastoma. And this is really the first time this has ever been shown. And so what we've done is based on those results, design, uh, designed a phase two study. This is called the ATT&CK2 study. And in this study, we're including all patients with newly diagnosed glioblastoma. They undergo surgery for a resection. They undergo the leukophoresis procedure where we collect their own white uh, uh, circulating white blood cells. They then undergo standard radiation and temozolomide. And during that time, we take their white blood cells to the laboratory where we're uh, develop developing that into dendritic cells. The vaccines are being prepared. And these dendritic cells are being primed against a particular viral RNA, uh, which is called PP65. It's a CMV RNA. And then when they come back, for the maintenance temozolomide, they receive a vaccine each month. Uh, and they're also getting the tetanus toxoid vaccine as we showed that this was much more efficacious. And at the same time, we're actually getting MRI scans of inguinal lymph nodes, which are your groin lymph nodes. And this is an example of one of the scans. And the other thing we're doing is collecting urine and serum on all these patients to do a metabolomics ev uh, evaluation because we've also shown that you can predict which patients are going to respond well to the vaccine and have a robust immune response based on the metabolic profile um, shown in their urine and their serum. So this is, uh, we're enrolling 120 patients. It's a three-arm study. There is one control arm and there are two vaccine arms. So you have about a two-thirds chance of getting the vaccine if you enroll in the study. Uh, and our other enrolling sites are Duke and um, Orlando. And we're very excited about this. Now, the other big... Um, uh, kind of strategy in immunotherapy are these immune checkpoint inhibitors or those drugs that I talked about, uh, which help uh, turn off the inhibitory signals within T cells. 
And the initial results, unfortunately, for these drugs for GBM have not been promising. These drugs have shown most promise uh, where they've received FDA approval in melanoma and in lung cancer. Um, but for GBM, the initial results have not been promising, although I will say uh, there are still multiple ongoing trials. And so um, there is now evidence that if you can actually activate the host immune system in some fashion, then the immune checkpoint inhibitor can work in glioblastoma. And these drugs include multiple uh, possibilities, uh, and particularly you may have heard of nivolumab or pembrolizumab, which are specifically inhibitors of a um, of an axis called PD-1, or programmed cell death one. Now, um, the trial that we have now at the University of Florida is called the PROGRESS trial. It's a phase one, two study. We're in the phase two part of it. And this actually uh, recruits recurrent DREBM patients, and we're randomizing them to receiving the pembrolizumab, which is the PD-1 inhibitor alone, or pembrolizumab with laser interstitial thermotherapy. And the reason that we're um, including that treatment with the PD-1 inhibitor is that we have evidence that the laser therapy results in a uh, breakdown of the blood-brain barrier that allows better penetration of drugs. We also have evidence that it actually induces an inflammatory immune response, thereby activating the host immune cells so that the drug can work better. This is uh, what it looks like for the laser uh, ablation. This is just kind of preparation of one of our patients. You have a head ring place because it's very important for us to have the laser probe placed very accurately within the tumor. And then you sit in the MRI scanner as the um, laser is turned on so that under real-time MRI imaging, we perform the laser ablation so we can see the heat that we're generating within the tumor. Um, the people who help this uh, make all this happen are really our um, clinical coordinators. So Nina McGrew is our clinical research supervisor. Fong Delarole is the clinical coordinator for the ATT&CK2 trial, and Sunny Warren is our clinical coordinator for the PROGRESS trial, but we all work as a large team. Um, and this is kind of, a, this is just a, a, a small representation of the people that make all the work that we do at the University of Florida possible. Any questions? Oh, thank you very much. That was very good. Uh, we have a bunch of questions. Great. First, uh, first who qualifies for the ATT&CK2 trial? What type of patients? So it's going to be newly diagnosed glioblastoma. Um, let me go back here. Um, they should be able to undergo surgery for a resection. Uh, so every once in a while, we'll have patients who are only really biopsy candidates just due to the size or the location of their tumor. And if you have a large amount of tumor um, that cannot be resected, unfortunately, you do not enroll. For, you cannot be enrolled in the study. And uh, patients who don't already have some viral illness such as active hepatitis B or hepatitis C or HIV. Is it okay if you have two tumors? It, that's a good question. You, if you have two tumors, but they're all contiguous on your MRI, um, kind of with T2 signal contiguously, then we consider it all essentially one tumor because there's tumor between the two tumors, then you can enroll. But if they really are two separate tumors with no um, evidence of tumor in between, so that's considered multifocal GBM, then they do not um, qualify for the study. Okay. Um, how important is it to remove all of the tumor, not for, just for this trial, but for any vaccine trial? So it's a very good question, and it's a question that neurosurgeons have been particularly interested in because it's part of what we do. And um, you can imagine that there's no way to create level one evidence for this, but there is a lot of very strong uh, either level two or level three evidence showing that the more of the tumor you're able to remove, the longer patients live. That's all with the caveat that you can do it safely without causing a new neurologic deficit. And so most... Um, most, uh, especially large institutions, really do strive to maximize the extent of resection, which means remove as much tumor as safely possible. Sometimes that does require us to use special tools to be able to achieve that. Uh, so one of the things that I do, as well as other surgeons in the country, will be to uh, do surgery with patients awake with cortical mapping of eloquent areas if we feel that the tumor is very close to areas of the brain that are important for a particular function. Do you ever use glialin? Um, good question. We do not use it uh, at the University of Florida, but it is something that is used at some institutions. Okay. Would it make sense to do vaccines before the radiation and chemo? Excellent question. Um, there are certain um, – There, we have currently one uh, trial that we're currently working to get online that does have that study design where you actually – 
uh, treat with your immunotherapy before um, resection. Um, sometimes the design of a study like that is a little bit challenging because to develop the vaccine actually takes time. Uh, and so you would have to have the perfect patient that can actually wait for surgery while the vaccine is being uh being created. And most of the time, we don't want to wait. Most of the time, patient's tumors are either the size or based on its location, we want to get it out as soon as possible. And so there's just a select few number of patients who we feel comfortable waiting on before they um, receive the treatment. But there are some study designs like that. How long does it take the vaccine uh, to be made? Uh, so for this dendritic cell vaccine, the, ent the entire, the actual dendritic cell Developing the dendritic cell pro, um, product takes us about three weeks, but then we have requirements through the FDA for um, quality assurance and sterility assurance. And so that takes another about two weeks. And so it's about a five week turnaround from the time that we receive the leukohoresis product to the time that we actually have um, dendritic cell vaccines within the syringes. Okay, that probably is too long to wait. Yeah. Um, how long does it take vaccines to work? Are they fast acting or do they take a period of time before they kick so, out? Hopefully the answer is both. Uh, so when you deliver the dendritic cell vaccine, you get um, cells within the dermis and they actually get to the lymph node usually within 24 to 48 hours. So you're getting an immune response uh, almost immediately. And so when they get to the, um, the lymph nodes, it does not take, you know, it's within a matter of hours once they get to the lymph node to present that antigen to lymphocytes and actually induce a lymphocytic response, which means the T cells are actually proliferating and getting out of the lymph node and starting to circulate around the blood and start looking for this abnormal pathogen. Uh, but what we want is that we want those T cells to stay. So that process that I just talked about happens within, you know, 48 to 72 hours. Uh, but if you don't continue to vaccinate, those T cells may start to, you know, decrease in number and efficacy. And so that's why the, it's not just a single vaccine. That's why patients receive vaccines on a monthly basis. So you can keep that T cell population up and going. Okay. Do you ever see autoimmune diseases as a side effect of any of these immunotherapies? Great question. Um, we have never seen that in any of our um, uh, studies thus far um, at the University of Florida, but it is definitely a concern with any immunotherapy. Uh, immunotherapy is definitely different than chemotherapy. The side effects of chemotherapy are obviously immunosuppression, uh, and de depending on the chemotherapy, it can be uh, toxic to the heart or toxic to the peripheral nerves. Immunotherapy, the, pro the, the risk profile is a little bit different, and autoimmune disease is number one on that risk profile. And in these large studies of either T cell infusions, um, chemokine or cytokine infusions, or immune checkpoint inhibitors, there are absolutely reported a small but uh, definite risk of autoimmune disease or um, cytokine storm, which is kind of an overwhelming inflammatory response of the body, which can be life threatening. Okay, with vaccines, um, there's a lot of vaccines available right now. Would it actually make sense to combine multiple vaccines? Like you're against the one particular target, it's the CMV PP65 RNA. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's other ones, for example, like uh, ICT107, which is mm -hmm. against a few other ones. Would it make sense to combine or would they hurt each other? Honestly, we don't know the answer to that. Um, I, don't, uh, I don't know the answer to that. We would have to do studies to know for sure. Um, but the, the core of that question, which is, I think is true, which is there is not just one single approach for glioblastoma. We all know that glioblastoma is very robust. Um, from patient to patient, glioblastoma can be very different. They're very molecularly different from patient to patient. And as we establish more and more um, data on exactly how to group patients, and it's not going to just be all comers, you know, all glioblastoma comers is going to be based on the mutational profile of the tumor. Each patient should be treated differently. And I do think that in terms of how far we've come with GBM, we're definitely behind when it comes to other cancers and this type of approach. But at places like the University of Florida, and I'm sure also at other institutions, it's definitely what we're striving to, to achieve. Okay, this is a strange theoretical question. With the injection site, matter? Like uh, some places would do it in the armpit, some in the groin. Does the distance from the injection site to the tumor make a difference? Or it just circulates? Oh, that's a great question, actually. Um, it should not. Because um, once you have the circulating T cells um, in the peripheral blood, it shouldn't. Now, the, the distance from the site of injection to the lymph node does make a difference. Uh, and so you do, you know, that's why people are either using armpit for you know, your axillary lymph nodes or thigh for inguinal lymph nodes is because you want to be 
close to a large set of lymph nodes where you can get a robust immune response, but the distance to the tumor should not make a difference. Okay. Um, some people mentioned using Aldara cream. That's like a, a mic, was it a micromod, micromod cream. Uh, do you do something like that? And what does it do? Um, it's a good question. We don't routinely um, uh, use that and honestly don't have enough experience to be able to answer that question. Okay. Um, oh, we've already asked another question asked, can you combine vaccines? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, a good question. Let me see. That's about all I had. Uh, all we have questions for you now. Any last questions, anybody? Let me see. Um, wait, there's one more coming in. Okay, can you go back to that slide that showed the 50% survival with the CMV vaccine? Mm -hmm. uh, is that newly diagnosed or uh, recurrent glioblastoma? This was newly diagnosed. Um, and essentially, um, this was actually a small trial, even though it was published in Nature. Uh, and in this study, um, you know, the survival difference, at the, the final survival difference between the groups was about 36.6 months in the patients who received the dendritic cell vaccine with the tetanus toxoid versus about 18 months um, in the group that received the vaccine alone without the, without the tetanus toxoid. How many patients was that? Um, Good question. I have to look at the paper to remember exactly the patient number. Okay. Uh, I have it somewhere here on my desktop. But oh, it was, it was well, less than 20. It was less than 20 patients. It was either 20 or less. Okay. And are any of these vaccines close to getting FDA approval? Uh, so I would say the one that may be the closest um, would be, you know, DC Vax just had their phase three um, trial. So essentially our, our vaccine currently is in phase two um, studies. That's where most of the dendritic cell vaccines are right now. The only FDA approved dendritic cell vaccine is Provenge, which is a dendritic cell vaccine for hormone uh, resistant prostate cancer. Uh, and that's the only one currently on the market for any cancer. Uh, but um, DC Vax just published their phase three results. So if anyone was close to potentially getting FDA approval, it would be um, DC Vax if their phase three meets the uh, criteria that the FDA would require. Well, theoretically, something like the CMV, if your phase two shows results like this, maybe could get accelerated approval through a phase two. Uh, for a phase, well, for a phase three, it would have to still put oh, phase uh, two. Phase three, yeah. Okay. Um, another question. Uh, there's no way to combine the DC vaccines outside of cl uh, clinical trials right now. You can't get access for your like right to try or compassionate use, can you, of your vaccine? No, unfortunately not, because we don't really understand the um, safety of that type of approach. So really what the FDA or any regulatory body for that matter would want is for you to prove that one strategy is either efficacious or uh, that is both safe and efficacious before you started combinatorial strategies with other agents that are no, that are also not known to be either safe or efficacious. And so the problem with um, combining multiple vaccines from different institutions would be that uh, all of them right now are not FDA approved. Right. And so they're you're basically combining two unknowns. And so the FDA tends not to um, smile friendly upon that. They'd rather just try to go with one strategy, prove that it's actually you, you know, both safe and working. And if you do that, then you can start working on combinatorial strategies. There are definitely strategies in combination, dendritic cell vaccines with immune checkpoint inhibitors that people are working on, uh, but two different types of dendritic cell vaccines um, are not something that people are very excited about. Okay. Uh, one of our members, Harvey, has a question. Harvey, can you speak? Unmute yourself. Hello, do you hear me? Yes. Hi, Arvi. Hello. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm a GBM patient and I'm uh, doing uh, DC va uh, vaccination in, in Lithuania. Wonderful. So, so my idea was and is uh, uh, how to combine the tetanus toxoid with the, uh, with the DC vaccine I'm receiving. Yeah? Okay. So, I already received the, the first vaccination, uh, DC vaccination, and 24 hours prior to that, I received uh, uh, intramuscular uh, tetanus and diphtheria sh uh, shot. And I don't know 
how would be the best that uh, I I combine uh, um, the tetanus toxoid with with the next to DC vaccines. Eh? Um, yeah, you know, essentially that's what we're doing is, is just prior to the dendritic cell vaccine is vaccinating patient against tetanus tox with tetanus toxoid. And so, um, you know, what you're receiving is uh, pretty close to what we're doing in our clinical trial. And it is an approach that we're pretty excited about in terms of actually getting more dendritic cells to migrate to your lymph node. Wait, how often do you give the tetanus toxoid injection in your trial? Uh, so they definitely get it with uh, vaccine one because that's when you start it, and then we'll get it intermittently with the um, with the subsequent vaccines. And you know we're really trying to, um, you know, we're really trying to get patients to uh, be vaccinated for as long as possible. But right now, it is, there is a little bit of a limitation in how many vaccines we can uh, develop from their own leukophoresis product. You know, so we leukophoresis the patients, and everything we receive from their leukophoresis, we turn into a vaccine. So we try to get about 10, you know, 10 vaccines produced uh, for patients from leukophoresis products. But if we don't get enough, then they may have to undergo a second leukophoresis at some point for us to produce more vaccines for them. Okay. So, um, okay. Sorry. Uh, uh, so uh, regarding my question about uh, tetanus toxoid preconditioning, so would would you recommend that I precondition the vaccine, uh, the uh, DC vaccine site uh, at uh, uh, every DC vaccination, or I don't know, just uh, on the second or third or fourth, or something like that? How often are you receiving your dendritic cell vaccine? Every every month, every four weeks. Okay. That's essentially what we're doing. Um, what I would say is I don't know if I can recommend it to you because honestly, it's still a treatment that we have in clinical trial. And so, um, you know, it's not, uh, what I would say is the reason I can't tell everybody um, on a DC vaccine study to go out and get tetanus toxoid pre-vaccination is because right now we're just in phase two trials, although our phase one study was really exciting. Um, we really want to have FDA approval for this strategy before we start recommending it to people because, you know, sometimes, as you know, with any treatment, as you take it through trials, yeah. you know, it's I mean, I understand completely, yeah, but I mean, I figure there is no uh, uh, huge risk of adverse side effects. So, I, I mean, I'm going to do it. Yeah? I hear so, you. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Uh, yeah. And uh, would you, rec I mean, what would be. Uh, uh, what would make more sense than uh, to do do the preconditioning at every vaccination or just at second, third, or fourth? I think as long as you're not having toxicity associated with the vaccination, if you wanted to do it pre prior to each vaccination, that should be okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Harvey. Um, two more questions came in. This trial focuses on CMV. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think about targeting the CMV directly with Valcite? Great question. Um, it was a question that um, some neuro-oncologists uh, over the last several years have had. And the studies of Valcite, unfortunately, have not been very promising. Uh, and so it was something um, that uh, was studied in clinical trials. The clinical trial results were pretty much did not show a significant difference. The uh, investigators did go back retrospective, retrospectively to that data and then we're able to find that patients who received valcite longer than patients who didn't live longer, but that, that kind of analysis is a little bit flawed. Uh, and so most uh, people do not believe that valcite makes any significant difference in, in terms of survival and doesn't really use it. There's multiple potential reasons for that. Uh, and what's interesting is that what we've found is that um, CMV testing on patients actually doesn't um, really predict who would or would not respond to the vaccine. And so uh, we don't even require patients to be CMV positive to actually receive the vaccine. Okay. Um, two or three more just came in. Is it any benefit to give the tetanus shot outside of a trial without the vaccine? Uh, no. The answer to that is absolutely not. And because the tetanus toxoid vaccine is essentially just accelerating the um, migration of those dendritic cells that we're delivering to the lymph node. And so if you got the tetanus toxoid without any dendritic cells to help migrate to the lymph node it essentially would just be immunizing you against tetanus but would not be providing you benefit against your tumor. Uh, about when should we see the results of the attack 2 trial? How long? 
So we're currently enrolling, uh, and we're hoping to finish accrual. Uh, we, you know, we basically just opened about a year ago. It's a trial where we're trying to enroll 120 patients. And so we're hoping that we would have completed enrollment within the next couple of years. And so I would say it would be at least two years before we have some results that we could publish or at least present. Okay. And do you think these same vaccines would also work for recurrent glioblastoma? I know you're not doing it right now. But yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, once we, um, you know, kind of figure out exactly the role of this vaccine in newly diagnosed patients, then um, absolutely the next step would be to figure out what patients within that group of newly diagnosed respond the best, and also if this is something that we can carry over to patients with recurrent disease. Okay, we hit our half hour. There's just one last quick one. Yes. Uh, it wouldn't make any difference if it's a secondary or primary glioblastoma, would it? For the um, so, yeah, so great question. Uh, for us right now, um, we want de novo newly diagnosed GBM. Um, cause secondary GBM, um, you know, by definition usually is the recurrent. Okay. Exactly. Uh, and so I will say that, um, in terms of, um, treatment in general, we are now learning a lot about these tumors and we know that secondary GBM is very different, um, than de novo GBM and, um, molecularly it's very different. And so, Moving forward, we will likely end up having um, two different treatment uh, paradigms for these types of tumors since they're so molecularly different. Okay, I'm sorry, but there's a couple more. Okay. Um, Harvey asks one more question. Should the tetanus toxoid be applied uh, intramuscular, subcutaneous, or intradermally, and how far from the DC vaccination site or at the same place? Um, you know, that's a good question. Um, I, we don't really have a good answer to that in that we haven't done direct comparisons. How do you do um, it? And I would say intradermal, um, would probably be his best bet and, and pretty close to his, um, to his DC vaccine site. Okay. That's all the questions right now. So we'll stop right here. Thank okay. you very much. It was a perfect presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Al. And thank you for everyone who joined us. Bye-bye.